This is a bold move. These countries are telling Africa and telling their colleagues in West Africa, we cannot continue to pretend we are leaving and we are sending a clear statement and that statement they have already said by saying that we are moving towards a confederation. Sometimes you need a break in order to have genuine unity. We are not going to have French military in our territory. We are not going to have the military of another nation in our territory. We are going to change our currency. We are going to have new friends. Those can be done immediately. And once you've laid that foundation, then you move deliberately towards total liberation. But in the knowledge that is not a fight for the faint-hearted, you are going to be resisted. You are going to be fought. Some are going to be sent to the cemetery sooner rather than later. Not easy, but that which is easy is not worth fighting for. You know, the situation in the Sahel that is involving Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso should be a wake-up call to regional African institutions and even African institutions. People join bodies for specific reasons. If you look at the economic community of West African states and you look at the treaty that creates it, the body was meant to provide a forum under which the countries would enjoy greater political intimacy and economic benefits. And what has happened in the recent past, because of the activities of individual and group, individual politicians and groups of politicians in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, there have been changes of government in what in classical terms would be described as unconstitutional changes of government by military personnel. But what is unique is that these changes enjoy popularity on the ground. We have seen thousands, if not millions, of people on the ground, and immediately that happened in Burkina Faso. The people celebrated in Guinea, people celebrated. But when it happened in Niger, we saw ECOWAS issuing threats and instituting sanctions on Niger specifically. And this then called into question, why do you abandon us in our hour of need, complete with closure of borders, uh, those with countries uh, which border Niger? So the decision that has been made by those three countries is informed by the argument, which you cannot fault, that we no longer find value in ECOWAS. And if we joined for specific reasons, we joined in order to enjoy security, we joined in order to enjoy economic benefit, and our friends have turned into bad Samaritans and are no longer good Samaritans, then why should we continue to participate in this organization? It is unfortunate, but understandable. In fact, I've, I've had some individuals who understand Pan-Africanism, in my view, in a totally different sense than I do, saying that this move is not in keeping with Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism does not mean that you swallow poison. Pan-Africanism means that you engage in activities that enhance the spirit of Ubuntu and Pan-Africanism in a sustainable manner. So it is true that this is a bold move. These countries are telling Africa and telling their colleagues in West Africa, we cannot continue to pretend we are leaving and we are sending a clear statement and that statement they have already said by saying that we are moving towards a confederation. Sometimes you need a break in order to have genuine unity. And that is what I understand the leadership in Niger, in Burkina Faso, and in Mali, and by extension even Guinea-Bissau, to be making.
brave move indeed. You know, it is very easy from a sentimental perspective to say, oh, Kenya came and Kenya became a brother or a sister in need. But we've got to understand the circumstances and the facts. Haiti or Haitians are of African descent, that cannot be denied. The Haitians have suffered since they regained their independence from France. Haitians have suffered since they were effectively occupied by the United States of America. Haitians have continued to suffer under many gangs. Haitians had a dalliance with some kind of democracy during the governorship or the, the governorship of Jean Patrie Aristide. Haiti, Haiti is suffering. But the question is, is it not proper that a major power such as the United States in the neighborhood should be the one that is present in Haiti? Is it not proper that those in the neighborhood such as Brazil and other countries are the ones that should be responding to this need? Is it not proper that African Union as African Union should be responding rather than Kenya which has our own security problems internally. These are the questions that we must respond. You cannot let your house burning and you run after rats. And we are saying that the decision by the Kenyan government, however well intentioned, is one that must be subjected to scrutiny. I refuse to believe that we are the only country that has the capacity, the trading, the wherewithal, or even the finances to undertake this very expensive enterprise. The truth is that we are simply the handmaidens of the United States of America, which does not want to have men and women in boots in Port-au-Prince. Individuals will earn allowances, so for their families it will be a good thing. I do not know, but I suspect that the Kenyan government would also derive some pittance of economic benefit and diplomatically will be deemed and be considered to be the good boys by the United States of America. That is the extent to which I think will benefit. But let us be warned. And the Haitians have said so, that they'll ensure that there are body bags returning to Kenya. Haiti is not a walk in the park. This is a country that has been overrun by gangs. Our police officers are not trained to confront that particular environment. They do not understand the environment. Many of them do not understand the language of transaction, which is French, I fear that our young men and women are like lambs being taken to the slaughter. And we, as some would say, had better smell the coffee. Unfortunately, we are bent on going to Haiti. Our government is bent on ensuring that our troops are taken to Haiti. And I hope that we'll not regret. It may be said that the thousand have gone there possibly to ensure that they are only confined to the area in the capital of Haiti in Port-au-Prince and that there will be other support forces. But what we have not done, in my view, I'm quite certain that the Americans may have done it, they will say, and that they have shared this particular intelligence with the Kenyans, but the truth be told, are we going there to police? Do you police an environment where there is violence and chaos, where there are drug barons, where there are gangs, gangs that are not restrained in any manner, in a terrain that you do not understand? My fear is that we are sending our young men and women into what could turn out to be a hellish environment. It is sad, it sounds good 
when we say that they will be sending money to the Akith and Kin in Kenya, it is sad when we are arguing that it is good for Kenya's image. It is sad when we are claiming that it is good because this is uh, African brotherhood or sisterhood. But brotherhood and sisterhood must be informed and must be underguarded by a proper analysis of the true value that you are going to bring in the environment in which you find yourself. I've of course seen the Asians coming to Kenya, particularly the political class, but the political class in Haiti have lost touch with the population. They are no longer in touch with the population. And if I was asked to say in a single sentence whether the decision to take our police officers to Haiti is a good decision, I would say bad decision, bad judgment call. If there is a country that has the knowledge, the training, the financial wherewithal to get into Haiti, that country is the United States of America which is in the neighborhood, which knows the terrain, it is the country that should be sending men and women in boots, not Kenya, which is far removed geographically from Haiti. You know, we are pawns in a political chessboard which we do not understand. We are merely being used as pawns in this political chessboard and the person who are using us in this regard is an administration in the United States of America and they have gotten a seal of approval from the UN General Assembly and I think it is sad for African countries, individual African countries to allow themselves to be used in this manner. The wise thing, as I've said, would have been to say if we want to go there in terms of showing solidarity with Haiti as Africans, we would have contributed troops or police officers drawn from different countries in the continent of Africa and supported by other countries in that hemisphere led by the United States of America. Then I would say this is a multinational police force and we are contributing, Kenya contributing 50, Uganda 50, Tanzania 50, Nigeria 100, South Africa 50, then we speak with the single voice of the African Union. But to want to look good in circumstances where to look good is to be naive is in itself unfortunate and deserves condemnation. Kenya, to her credit, has in the past contributed very positively to peacekeeping missions, both within and without the country. And remember, in those instances, we sent our armed forces, as they were then called, we now call them the defense forces. We served very effectively in Namibia, we served very effectively in Liberia, our troops served very effectively in Pakistan, in Pakistan I think, our troops served very effectively in Iraq. We have a good track record, but I'm afraid that this good track record is going to be spoiled by this particular decision to send our police officers. And remember, the High Court has already pronounced itself on this particular subject and uh, they have come out quite clearly and indicated that the decision that has been made by the Kenyan government flies in the face of Kenyan law because the only force that we can deploy are our defense forces, not our police officers. And I note that the government of the Republic of Kenya has already said they are going to ignore the decision, effectively. Kenyan government have said, they let the court say what they want, but we are going to do what we want because we have a bilateral relationship with Haiti and we can ignore whatever the court say and do what we want to do because we are entitled to do it. And this in itself is also sad because a country must be a country that obeys laws, however unpopular those laws are, and however those, however in, uh, however unfortunate in their view, the decisions of the courts are as founded on interpretation of the laws that govern the country. Because if you begin to disobey laws as a country, then you are sending only one message: that the laws don't matter. 
that we can cherry pick as a country what to obey and what not to obey and that is how you welcome anarchy in your country and when you remove the genie out of the box or out of the bottle you can never quite return the genie into the bottle countries have paid for it the present day haiti must be understood in the context of the political style of jean claude duvalier papa doc who was himself a medical doctor but in order to remain in power he used the several methods including voodoo and violence you will remember and those who are familiar with haitian history will remember the tonton makout who are uh, used by the duvalier administration to intimidate opponents to intimidate the population and when papa doc died his son uh, the younger duvalier normally referred to as baby doc also adopted the same style so that political violence and the use of gangs became the style of political operation in haiti in order to survive in haiti you need gangs and gangs acquire a life of their own and when they acquire a life of their own they become monsters which cannot be controlled even by those who founded them when for a short period the haitians were tired and they had something in the nature of what is described was described as a democratic uh, dispensation the catholic priest the very popular catholic priest Jean Patron Aristide came in and tried to dismantle the gangs and no sooner had he settled in office than he himself was removed and exiled sending the one story that when gangsterism becomes the way of conducting politics it is not easy to remove that culture from the political scene and for that reason it becomes a way of life a culture and that is what haiti is suffering from if i was asked haiti is a country that is ripe for being made a mandated territory of the united nations to be governed by an administration appointed by the united nations for initially a period of 10 years subject to renewal so that you destabilize and dismantle the crop of politicians whose mode of operation is violence and then you can introduce a new political culture which will be responsive to the dictates of good governance and rule of law not in the present circumstances the world is too busy with many things so that haiti is not something that is in the focus of the major players in the political arena so it is not going to happen soon what is going to happen is that the united nations and other interested countries periodically are going to enter into these band aid solutions such as taking the kenyan police or some other police to appear to be doing something without addressing the problem so effectively what we are doing and what the international community is doing to haiti is to apply what i call band aid solution to a cancerous problem dealing with the symptoms rather than the fundamental problem and as long as you deal with the symptoms without addressing the real problem then of course the wound continues to fester and people continue to suffer and the international community continues to pay lip service and to con- continues to do that which does not solve what needs to be solved that is the unfortunate situation in haiti for kenya not to have puppeteers kenya is a puppet the puppeteers are the major powers as regards haiti it is the united states of america and the dominant western nations remember that the colonial project now neo colonial project and given the architecture of international politics and military and economics countries such as kenya acting alone are very weak vulnerable and susceptible to manipulation so that when you hear some of us talk about african unity 
East African unity and ultimately African unity, we know that divided and economically and politically and military weak as we are, there is nothing we can do. We cannot resist. We are given something, a little carrot, and we run with our tails up because we are indebted. We are weak. We are manipulable. And unless we learn that unity is our salvation and unity of purpose, then we will continue to be puppets. We will continue to be pawns in the political chessboard. Unfortunately, because of the nature of international politics and dynamics, it is not going to be easy to change immediately, but immediate steps can be taken to begin to move away. In fact, what we have seen in Niger, what we have seen in Burkina Faso, what we have seen in Mali to a certain extent, what we have seen in Guinea to a certain extent, tells us that there are things that you can do immediately. Completely say, we are not going to have French military in our territory. We are not going to have the military of another nation in our territory. We are going to change our currency. We are going to have new friends. Those can be done immediately. And once you've laid that foundation, then you move deliberately towards total liberation. But the most important thing is that the decisions made for immediate action must be decisions that are informed by the reality and informed by patriotism. And knowing that those whom you are fighting against will also resist. And you can only resist them if you are organized and if you work in concert. That is the only way that we are going to resist. And we have examples of countries, as I've already indicated in Africa, that have done that in Tanzania. We were able to see it when John Joseph Pombe Magufuli became the president within a very short time. He was making decisions that were going to liberate Tanzania. And even in Rwanda, after the genocide, we saw the RPF Kagame administration say, we are going to move away. And even recently in Uganda, the administration of President Museveni having been removed from the, the, the circle of blue-eyed boys and girls of the United States of America is beginning to move away. But in the knowledge that it is not a fight for the faint-hearted, you are going to be resisted. You are going to be fought. Some are going to be sent to the cemetery sooner rather than later. Not easy. But that which is easy is not worth fighting for. <laughs>